<coughs> Hello, this is the third installment in the Neuroblastoma series. And um, <coughs> what we're going to discuss now is how, how the neuroblastoma is, in essence, a recapitulation of the biology of the sympathetico adrenal lineage. And so, we know that the sympathetic nervous system exists as ganglia and, for example, at the adrenal medulla along the spinal column. That it receives central input, which is called presynaptic input, and that the neurotransmitter uses cholinergic or acetylcholine. And then the ganglia themselves release or have, you know, neurons and the neurotransmitter used by the ganglion cells, the postsynaptic ganglia of the sympathetic nervous system, is norepinephrine or adrenaline. And we also know that the adrenal medulla is very, very similar, but its neurotransmitter is, epi is epinephrine or adrenaline. So, so it's really a lot there's a lot of similarity between the cells of the adrenal medulla and the cells of the sympathetic chain. And we know that the neuroblastoma can arise from either site. And um, in fact, whether a neuroblastoma arises within the adrenal medulla versus whether it arises along the sympathetic chain or along the organs of Zucker candle, we know that the biology is roughly similar. Now, we also discussed in a previous lecture on how the cells populate the sympathetic chain and the adrenal medulla arise from the neural crest and bud off at a certain stage in development from the neural tube. Here's what it would look like in cross section and here's wh what it looks like in longitudinal section. So there's a certain part of the closing brain tube where the neural crest buds off. And then these cells sort of go for a walk, and they form various lineages throughout the body, but that includes the sympathetic chain, in other words, the postsynaptic sympathetic ganglia, and the adrenal medulla, and many other structures that we've alluded to. So here you could just have imagined the cells budding off and doing their walk, and then forming these structures. But as the cells bud off, what we need to go from is primitive precursors that have originally budded off to finally the formation of a mature ganglia. And a mature ganglia is an admixture sorry, a mature ganglia is an, is an admixture of mature ganglion cells, so you can imagine a neuron, so a mature neuron with its axonal process and having a distinctly neuronal kind of nucleus which is an open chromatin structure and then some interposed Schwann cells and even some intermediate connections but so that's sort of the cells that ultimately form the ganglia but the cells that break off in development don't look like that they're sort of these sort of what we call small round blue cells. They're sort of undifferentiated cells and they, they look primitive. They don't have a definite phenotype. They're almost like stem cells and then they have to differentiate and form the neurons and form the Schwannian cells and form the mature structure. So these are the cells that migrate off from the neural crest embryologically. And exactly that really is what a neuroblastoma is. It's an abnormal persistence, really, of the immature embryonic phenotype. And if you have persistence of the immature embryonic phenotype within your end organs, then that clone of cells or that group of cells could cause problems. And in fact, that's a very important concept in pediatric pathology. So whereas adult m tumors are the accumulation of multiple mutations, sort of like a Gordian knot of mutations that occur in a lineage over time.
because you get one problem and then another problem and then another problem and then it accumulates to become almost like an unsolvable problem or a problem that's very difficult to solve, sort of like a Gordian knot. That's like an adult problem. It's a problem of senescence. It's a problem of accumulation of wear and tear over the time. Pediatric tumors are very, very different. What they are, are tumors of, of development. They're a persistent developmental state. And so many, many times. And that's why we use the word blast. So for example, blastoma. So you have neuroblastoma, which is the tumor that we're talking about today. But you also have nephroblastoma, which are the, the cells that make the kidney. And that's also known as the Wilms tumor. You have hepatoblastoma. The blast is a precursor cell. It's, and we, of course, have them in the in the hematolineoid, hematolymphoid lineage, and, you know, AML, ALL, you know, hematopathology, but here we're AP only, so we sort of won't worry about that, but, but this term blastoma designates a um, persistent, immature state, and that really is the biological problem in pediatric tumors as opposed to uh, grown-up tumors or opposed to adult tumors, and this was known for a long time. And there's a famous book that was written, I believe, at first in 1921 by an author called Abraham Willis. And the, border is, the, book, the book is called The Borderland of Embryology and Neoplasia. And this is a book that if you have any sort of old pathologists in your department, you'll probably see them with a copy of this book. This book is central to... I think, a certain generation of pediatric pathologists who are looking at both pediatric tumors and developmental disease. But let's just think a little bit very, very briefly about the cells that are migrating and forming these mature structures in the sympathetic lineage. So we could sort of imagine that you have the cells that break off, the neural crest-like cells. And these are sort of like stem cells. They have, in some way, the property of the stem cells, but also precursor cells. And you know, biologists might take exception to how glib I'm being with these terms, but let's imagine that a precursor cell is a little bit differentiated, but has a very, very high turnover kinetic. It's very, very replicative, whereas, so it's very, it's rapidly cycling. Whereas stem cells are slower cycling, but they're more, they have more totipotency. They could turn into more things. And so, Without going into too much detail, you can imagine that the very immature tumors that don't really look like anything are just like an admixture of stem cells and precursor cells without any differentiation. And that is what pathologists call a small round blue phenotype because it's just basically nucleus with minimal cytoplasm, minimal differentiation, minimal phenotype. That's your small round blue cell because after all, it's usually the cytoplasm that speaks more to phenotype. So your small round blue cells, they have high nuclear ratio, a high, high mitotic activity, high apoptotic activity, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So this is sort of like your first stage in your development. And, it, and, and your more primitive tumors recapitulate this population, this very undifferentiated small round blue cell population. And so the first type of neuroblastoma that we get are the undifferentiated neuroblastomas that show no differentiation. Biologically, as these cells are moving along and coming to populate the sympathetic chain, maybe let's say once they get there, they start to, some of the cells start to undergo, let's say for the sake of theory here, an asymmetric division. So you have one of these precursor cells or stem cells, let's say a precursor cell, and it undergoes an asymmetric division. And one of the daughter cells is a precursor cell, just like the father cell or just like the mother cell, and that's destined to repopulate and form more precursor cells, and this is like your small round blue population. But yet, one of the other cells now has a little bit more cytoplasm. He's acquired a little bit more cytoplasm, and now has differentiation capacity, and starts on a pathway with, with after several replications, you start to get what? You start to get eccentric nuclei, the chromatin is less dense, it has a peripheral condensation, you get these central nucleoli, you start to almost get dendritic structures, and even axonal-like extensions. And you start to see a more neuronal phenotype. And this is the progenitor cell. They're starting to become more differentiated. So with easy for them, they start to form these cells that look a little bit neural. 
And some of the differentiation steps as you go along along might actually form a lineage that's not entirely neural, but a separate lineage with different markers expressed that are Schwannian, that are the connective tissue types that are also part of the, the, the ganglia. Because the, all the constituents of the ganglia, including the neural and glial elements, are formed by these precursors. So if we imagine, let's say, around at this stage, sorry, that wasn't the world's straightest line, but if we imagine it around this stage, these level of progenitors that are more mature have an analogy in a tumor as well. So while this population, so we'll call this two, so while this population has an analogy in the undifferentiated tumor, a tumor that shows no differentiation capacity, this population of cells have an analogy in the poorly differentiated tumor. There's still a lot of small round blue undifferentiated cells, but some of the cells are starting to show a neuronal phenotype. And that is a poorly differentiated neuroblastoma. And then if we could imagine after many, many maturation states, you have cells that look almost completely neuronal and cells that look quite Schwannian, but maybe you have the odd small round blue cell that still has some persistent, not fully differentiated phenotype, and that we could call our maturing population, and that could be three. Okay. So... This is the progression, this is the biological progression of the migrating sympathetic precursors. But it, as we said, it has a reflection in tumors. This side of the equation has a reflection in the undifferentiated tumors. The middle has a reflection in the poorly differentiated, and as we get more mature, that's reflected in the tumor that are differentiating. Now, anyone who knows sort of the terminology of um, the pathology of neuroblastoma is familiar with the name Shimada. And he's alive and well, and still has many years, hopefully, of his career left. People hear these eponymous names and think it must be some famous person from the relical past. But it's not. Dr. Shimada is a very active neuropediatric uh, pathologist working in California, and he developed a classification scheme for neuroblastoma. And he's a great man and very, very central and pivotal to our field. But Shimada made a very, very important observation. And what Shimada's observation was, for a long time, pathologists would see these various tumors, histological ones, histological two, they weren't divided that way, just tumors that were undifferentiated, tumors that were poorly differentiated, tumors that were more differentiating, and they would try to say, well, will the patient do well or not do well, and the histology was not prognostic. And what Dr. Shimada realized is, what Dr. Shimada realized is, is that the histology might be prognostic if we compare it to the age of the patient. So in other words, if a child is very young, it may be okay to have a tumor that's more immature, because it's not that, it's not that much of a biological distortion. Whereas if a child is older, then the only tumors will act well are the ones that are more differentiated. And so in other words, the older the child is, the less we tolerate or the less good it is to have a phenotype that's too immature. So when you integrate the age of the patient with the histological level of differentiation, you do get a scheme that is prognostic and in very broad strokes. An undifferentiated tumor with no differentiation is never okay to have. A poorly differentiated tumor is okay if the level is appropriate to the age of the patient. But we also get an age, and that's around five, where everything should be mature, so none of these precursors are appropriate, and all tumors, virtually, unless it's benign, will be badly prognostic. So, the main revelation of Dr. Shimada was that the histological level of maturity can be prognosis if it's correlated with the age of the patient. And with that, I'll end this lecture and um, we'll, we'll, we'll move on in the next lecture. Thank you so much.